I start the, with a show of hands from the audience, if you can see. Um, how many of you out there have a GitHub account? How many of you use GitHub? It's a lot. And now, how many of you, you know, know you've heard of GitHub, but you don't quite know exactly what GitHub is for? <laughs> People are embarrassed, but <laughs> I think I think that there's a good number of people out there who know that this is a huge company, it's a big deal, it's changed a lot. But if they're not technical, if they're not developers, they don't really know. So if you can just give us the quick sort of elevator pitch, what do you tell people? What is GitHub? Yeah, so GitHub really is the best place for people to work on software projects together. And really this is about bringing large collections of people together to work on hard problems. Because especially in software, the problems that we face today require large teams of people working together on these complex problems to really be successful. And so the interactions that you have when you're working on software, like they're complex. There's really two parts to writing code. There's the writing of the code itself and creating images and workflows. There's also talking about that with everybody else on the team and making sure that everybody knows what's going on and being able to decide what the next decisions are, the next improvement to the product. And so while most people end up writing code on their own, being able to talk about that is something that you need help with. And so that's what we aim to do, is make that part of writing software easier by giving developers the best tools to do that. Now, when you founded GitHub, what was the status quo for coding and, and developing at that time? What are, what are the alternatives? What did you replace? Uh, there were a variety of code hosting platforms, but most of them were for open source. Right. So internally, people were using a lot of centralized version control systems. Uh, things like Perforce or uh, some of the Microsoft technologies. But it was all about locking what work could be done, right? Saying, I have control over this file. I have control over this chunk of the code, and you can't have it. So this, is, this was kind of the mainstay. It was control by preventing people from doing work. What we want to do is allow people to do the work without having to ask permission, and then propose a change and have a discussion around it. So you need what's called branching. You need to be able to say, here's the main version of what we're working on, the current version. I would like to make my own version with some improvements. Do that on your own terms, and then bring it back to the other people working on the project and have a discussion around it. And this wasn't happening a lot. This kind of collaboration, this easy experimentation, wasn't the standard 10 years ago. Now, this past year has been a big year for GitHub, because you started the company 2007, 2008? 2007, yeah. 2007, and you were bootstrapped, profitable, bootstrapped, small, scrappy yeah, that's right. startup uh, with a passionate user base for a long time. And then, for some people, it seemed like it came out of nowhere. GitHub got a $100 million venture capital investment from Andreessen Horowitz. This is now 14 months ago. Uh, and you've talked about this a lot over the past year, so I don't want to dwell too much on it. Yep. But why did you take that money? And, and what's been the biggest thing that has changed since, since you took on that money? Really, it was about looking at our path forward and looking at what the potential was for the company. We had a large user base. We had 100 people at the time that we took the investment. So we saw that we could achieve a lot of what we wanted to on our own, but also money was becoming a bottleneck. And so we saw what was possible. And it was that our ambitions were outstripping our ability to execute on those ambitions because we had to sink a bunch of money back into the bank account to be a responsible company, right? And that meant that we couldn't go after some of the really big opportunities, things like enterprise that we really needed to do that were very expensive, right? There's so many developers in the world and enterprise companies that also need to work in a better way. And this is where so many of the world's hardest problems are being tackled are in these large companies. And so we said to ourselves, we can keep doing this on our own and focus on these smaller companies and really super optimize for that. But we saw this much bigger opportunity to change the world in a much bigger way. And to do that, we needed a partner. And going after a large amount of money was something that we could do, and it allowed us to really make decisions based on what was best for our customers and not, was, not what was possible because of our bank account. And so we wanted to look for a partner that was very much like us, right? Because we had a choice of who we would want to raise money from. And so we ran a very long and careful process and 
we talked to all kinds of venture capital firms and people, and we settled on Andreessen Horowitz because of their founder friendliness, they understand software. They see that software is the future of the world. Everything involves software now. I could probably point to anything in this room and say how software made it possible. The movies that we watch, the vehicles that we drive, our iPhones, the watches that we're wearing these days, all of these things have massive components of software, and the, the people at Andrews and Horowitz believe that as well. And you mentioned GitHub for Enterprise. How is that different from GitHub.com? How is GitHub for Enterprise doing? GitHub for Enterprise is doing extremely well, I'm happy to say. They're different in that GitHub.com is a web application. You log on to it via the internet. GitHub Enterprise is the same thing, essentially, but packaged up so that large enterprise companies can install it on their own infrastructure, so that they have complete control over who has access to it, uh, even by putting it behind their firewall, so that they can make sure that they have the kinds of compliance needs that, that are relevant to companies of that size. Right, and so this allows companies to share within each other, but they don't share out the larger community. Yeah, we talked to a lot of people in the early days, and they said, hey, GitHub sounds really awesome. We want to use this. This is a better way for people to develop, but we're not going to use your website. It's just not going to happen. So we thought about how we could package it up and deliver it to them in a way that made it possible for them to have control. Like, they want no information going from their installation to the outside world at all. So the only way that you can accommodate that is by allowing them to install it on their own infrastructure. What's the biggest challenge when you're getting companies to, to switch over to use GitHub internally? What, what sector has been the biggest challenge? I think of the financial services sector, like Goldman Sachs. You know, if you, if you sat down with the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, and you'd say, why should I ever put anything in some sort of open collaborative environment at all? My algorithms are, are the most treasured thing about what makes my company so successful. What would you tell him? Would it be possible at all to convince him? Yeah, actually, I've talked to CIOs and CTOs of a lot of large firms, including banks and like large multinational banks, as well as big retailers. Uh, and really, they're not too difficult to sell on the concept. Because what happens in large enterprises is that you have various divisions of the company grow up as silos, because you need to be able to have those people concentrate on what they're doing, right? So each division is concentrated so that they can have the right number of people to talk to, right? You can't talk to everyone in the company. You have to focus on what you're doing. The problem, though, is that you end up with these different silos. Each department is its own silo. They have all their own needs. And then you start having problems because they're not talking to each other. And in order to go after some of these very large opportunities that people are seeking, you need to break down these walls. And so when we talk to them about GitHub as being a place that can tear down the walls between the silos of companies to make it so that people can watch and follow and pay attention to just the software development or just the projects that they're interested in, then that's very attractive to them. So I've definitely sold companies on the idea of a more collaborative type of working, but they need permissions. Like this is where the challenge comes in, is in giving them the kinds of, inf and finally enough great permissions to control act who has access to what sensitive components. And how many companies? Can you give me numbers? What's the breakdown of GitHub.com versus GitHub for Enterprise? Well, we don't uh, publish numbers, but I can say that we have hundreds of thousands of paying institutions. And then GitHub, how many users do you have just totally now? So we just passed uh, a couple of weeks ago 4 million registered users that are collaborating on 8 million projects on GitHub.com. And then we don't keep track. We have no way of knowing exactly how many projects are in the enterprise. And are you still profitable? We're not running profitable at, at this current moment. The whole point of taking a large outside investment is to invest it in the future development of the company. Right, so you're in growth mode now. Exactly. Uh, tell me about your new office. I want to talk about the company itself a bit too, because when you took on this money, you had 100 employees already, you've doubled staff. Now yep. you're at about 200. 209 right now. 209. Um, and you're building, you just finished this new headquarters here in San Francisco. That's right. So you put a, le a little right. money into that. Uh, what's yeah, the hiring situation like? What's this new headquarters? What's the slick new venture funded GitHub like? <laughs> uh, it's very much like the old bootstrap to GitHub. Uh, we have a larger facility now, right? We're growing very quickly. We want to have a space that allows us to work in a way that's comfortable for us, right? That, that 
really allows for the kinds of collaboration and is designed around the way that we work. The way that we approach the office was by stepping back and thinking from first principles, what is an office for? What are the reasons that we need an office? And one of the biggest reasons that we have an office is to have visitors come by and work with us, right? We're all about collaboration and working better together. So we wanted an office that made that possible. And part of that is including a large event space in, on the first floor that allows us to host various kinds of events for the tech community and for GitHub related types of things. Right. And, and you have a big distributed workforce though. That's been something that you've been famous for from day one. You have employees all over the world. Yeah, so we have about two thirds of our workforce is distributed. Uh, so we're in about 35 states and 10 countries around the world. Right. How do you keep that all connected? I've heard that internally at GitHub, people use email, but even people who aren't developers at GitHub, they use GitHub. You guys all use GitHub to talk to each other. What, how does that work? How does a non-technical person, what do they do with GitHub? So even our lawyers and our press people, finance, everyone at GitHub uses GitHub. And it's really about the ability to create a project for anything. So while we started by super optimizing for just code, GitHub can work for anything, really. Because if you think about what we do at work today, it's about having files that we work on and then working on them with other people and then communicating about the future of the company. And so in that way, people can use GitHub to talk about the changes that they're going to make in the same way that we propose changes to code files and are able to look very specifically at what each line changed and what that means and have a discussion about that. When you're designing a legal document, for instance, you need to collaborate in the same way with the people that care about that document, whether it be a terms of service or a non-disclosure agreement that you want a potential candidate to sign when they come in. Whatever it happens to be, anyone at GitHub is allowed to look at those things and contribute to that conversation. And the way that we integrate with email is really great. You can at mention someone on GitHub. You can just say someone's name, a GitHub username, in an issue or a pull request, and they will be notified of that change. So it's a way to bring people in very easily that care about something, so easily that you'll actually do it. Because you probably won't take the time to go back out to email, craft a message to someone saying that, hey, you should go look at this thing, and then paste in the URL of what they want to look like. You know, that's, that's too much effort. So reducing the barrier to get these things done is how we make work better. And so it sounds like that's how you all use it at GitHub. How many other people outside of GitHub use GitHub that way? Going forward, how much easier do you want to make it so that people who are non-technical, that GitHub can be used for other things, for legal documents? Is that something that you're purposeful about? or? Yeah, I mean, there's a large amount of education that we need to do. So we're working on videos, a lot of video material to be able to demonstrate these workflows, because workflows are very hard to communicate in just static web pages. So what we want to do is show the world how we use GitHub and how other companies are using GitHub in unique ways for different types of situations, whether it be for law or finance or in their design groups or to interface with their customers in a very open way by showing them their own development. So video is how we're trying to tackle this education problem um, as well as just improving our marketing overall from both an enterprise and a dot com perspective. In the future, is your goal to have a law firm use GitHub, a, a place, or a journalistic, you know, a newspaper using GitHub internally, a place where the focus is not developing software, is something totally different? Could we want to we want to make those use cases possible. Yeah. Now we still optimize GitHub for software developers. This is something that's very important to us. Software is the future of the world, but we want to make it possible for everyone that works around software to be involved in those discussions while at the same time making the software flexible enough that lawyers or people within the government or anyone can use it to work on the projects that they care about. So we can do both, right? We're looking and we're just we're talking to a lot of people right now about how they use GitHub and to extend the use cases for GitHub. Now I want to talk a bit about the ethos of GitHub, this idea of collaborating. Uh, what, what is that like? <laughs> Why this well, it's, idea? It's pretty of, awesome. You should, you should try it. Well, no. I, so the the thing that people say always about GitHub is that it's it's this collaborative thing of here I fix that for you. Right. <laughs> you know what well, is? Well, it, it, it is. It's about it's about not having to ask permissions, right? It's about it's about preferring to get forgiveness rather than asking for permission by saying, hey, your thing is broken. 
I fixed it, you should check that out, right? Like this is the kind of main cycle that you see in open source all the time. And right, we come from an open source background. And so seeing this workflow, this workflow of, I proposed a change, let's discuss it and push it back in, this is really empowering. Because now no longer do you have to be blessed to work on a repository or project before you start the work. Instead, you can play with it in your own private workspace, do whatever you want to it, make mistakes, try things out, try 10 things out all at, all at once, right? Different things. Choose the best one and then show it back to the maintainers and say, hey, this is what I see as the future of this project. So it's, more, it's mostly an empowering thing by smoothing out those communication channels and bringing people closely together. It's about networking people more closely. So it gives people power. When you have this totally empowered user base and a highly, obviously, technical user base, What's that pressure like? Because this is a user base that, in a second, if they're somehow unhappy with something that GitHub has done, or a change that you've made as you become more mainstream, right. they can take their stuff and go home like that. They're not captive, they're not you know, some sort of group that doesn't know how to change their homepage or right. something. Yeah, if, yeah. if they don't like GitHub, they can leave tomorrow. How much pressure do you feel? Well, we always feel the pressure, and that's the way that we want it to be. We want to make sure that we're on the hook to build the best products for our customers. So making it easy to port your data from one place to another, that's part of it, right? Like the way that you win at software is not by locking people into using your platform. It's by building the best platform. And what's your software license of choice? Because when people commit code to GitHub, the things on GitHub, there are many different software licenses that they can choose from. There's no default, right? Correct. We don't force anyone to choose a specific license. It's part of the freedom of GitHub that you can put unlicensed things out in the open if you would like. Now, there's dangers to that. If you want people to use your software or whatever it is that you're building, then you should give it a license. It's the best way to make things freely available for people. If you don't have a license on something, it means that nobody's allowed to use it. That is the default, right? So what we do now is give people a chance to choose an open source license from a dropdown for a new project. Right? So the question is, what license should I use? Right. Well, the one that I use is the MIT license. I use it because it's simple and it gives people the most freedom. It's about this long on a computer screen. And really, it only reserves the right, it only forces people to maintain that copyright notice so that other people have that same freedom. And it means that they can't, um, well, that's pretty much it, actually, if I think about it. I mean, that's, that's how simple it is. So that's your personal choice when you write code. That's my personal that's choice because I want people, the software that I write, I want everyone to use it for any reason. I want them to build stuff with it and then charge me for it. That would be great, right? Like this is how we get better products in the world is by sharing the code, the great things that we do, and then allowing other people to build off them unfettered. At least that's my personal philosophy. And now that you have this 100 million from Andreessen, that's you know, implies some sort of exit of some sort. Is GitHub an IPO company? What's the time frame that you think of here in providing return to those investors? IPO or other exits isn't really something that we think or talk about a lot right now. It's still way too early for us. Like we have a lot of work to do before that even really enters our mind. And so what we're focused on is building the best products to solve these big problems with people working together. So I don't really have an answer for you on that one. Like literally, it's just not something that we're interested in thinking about right now. And when you talk about people working together, who's your biggest competitor here? When you talk about collaboration, there are a lot of big companies that are dealing with collaboration. Dropbox sure. comes to mind. Who are you fighting with in terms of users and then also in terms of your employees? You know, who, who is your competition in terms of hiring? I'd say from a competition perspective, we don't really look at the landscape and say, hey, these companies are doing these various things. We need to like answer to that. It's more about looking at what's possible in the world of collaboration. And it's about people's behaviors. It's about what they're doing, right? So if people are using email a lot to share documents back and forth, this is a huge problem, right? The work that people do needs to be next to the communication that they do. Like this is our vision for the future. And this is why GitHub puts the communication mechanisms, pull requests, like having discussions around work changes and being able to document those, put them next to the files that people are working on. Most often it's code, right? But put those things together. And so the challenge, the real competitor is behavioral. It's 
the technologies in general that we're using, and email primarily, getting people away from this mentality that, hey, everything can be accomplished via email, and that's the best solution. That is not the best solution for most problems. It closes things down. It doesn't give things a URL. Like a huge part of what we do is give things a URL so that when someone joins a company, you can say, hey, we already had all these discussions about this project you're gonna work on. Go look at them right here. You can't do that with email. Well, less email for everybody would probably be a good thing. <laughs> so Tom Preston Warner, thank you. Thank you very much.